Thank you so much for having me here today. It's wonderful to be back as a panelist supporting the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky. The last time I was here, I was discussing the relationship between social policy and health. Today, we'll be discussing toxic stress, maternal health, and patient-centered care. Now, it sounds like you've already heard a little bit about my background, so I'll just add that over the last several years, I've been working in two key areas. Some of you may know me from my work in public health consulting, as it included working with the Commonwealth of Kentucky. The other area I've been working in is in the maternal health research and nonprofit space. And I mention this to provide a bit of context around the perspective I have as I present on the topic of toxic stress. My presentation will cover three main areas. First, I'm going to begin by providing an overview of how toxic stress is considered when setting maternal health and maternal care experiences. This will of course include a discussion on racism, discrimination, and bias as a part of the patient experience. From there, I'll provide a few illustrations of how racism and bias exist in clinical care. And finally, I'll present a few considerations that might be useful for providers who are thinking through patient-centered opportunities to improve health. So let me first set the stage for why maternal health. A few years ago, I founded a research nonprofit dedicated to studying maternal care experiences, which are very much understudied. To give an example, we recently published a paper which illustrated how maternal health data and quality measures are infant-centric and do not fully allow us to understand the full range of burdens faced throughout a maternal health journey. However, if we were to take an expansive view and go beyond pregnancy and birth and focus on creating maternal-centric approaches, we find there are several other domains or experiences throughout the life cycle which influence health both immediately and in the long run. As many of us know, research on toxic stress highlights how early childhood experiences influence lifelong health outcomes. However, if we consider the maternal child dyad and think through how stress influences the mother, it can open up the story a bit further. There are several frameworks which conceptualize the pathways between external factors, racism, stress, and health, some of which you may have discussed today already. The Developmental Origins of Health and Disease Framework, which you may be familiar with, suggests that there are two histories of adversity that can contribute to poor child health outcomes. This means that in addition to traumatic events for a mother during childhood, a mother's experience of stress during the pregnancy itself can influence a child's development as well. Emerging evidence also suggests that exposure to vicarious racism or racism experienced by a caregiver is also associated with poor child health and development. Now at this point, I'd like to take a moment to humanize this discussion by sharing some maternal health stories. These lived experiences take place across the maternal care journey and highlight the types of stress that can occur as it relates to the interaction with the healthcare system. I'll call out one in particular during the postpartum period in the bottom right corner, as it will relate to a topic I'll cover later. This story highlights how different histories of adversity, which I mentioned before, and trauma can influence the well being for mother and child for years to come. She shares with us that she had a traumatic C-section, which brought on severe postpartum depression and PTSD. In every aspect of my pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, I was treated as a problem to be managed, not as a human being with my own desires. It set the stage for many years of struggle and suffering for me and my family. Now that we've heard about the maternal health perspective around toxic stress, 
I want to shift to discuss examples of racism and bias in clinical care. I'll begin with three examples from maternal health, but they have several parallels that can be seen in other care settings and among other patient subgroups. Beginning with the first one, the American College of OBGYNs or ACOG published a set of optimized care guidelines for postpartum health in 2018. They noted that the weeks following birth are a critical period for a woman and her infant and set the stage for long-term health and well-being. They called for care to expand upon requiring one follow-up visit after birth and advocated for a more comprehensive care plan aligned with a woman's individual needs throughout the postpartum year. Of course, this was a very positive step in creating more maternal-centric clinical recommendations for the postpartum year. However, I'd like to present the perspective written in a commentary about these recommendations by Scott and Davis, who highlighted the following. Our overall impression of the committee opinion, whether intentional or not, is the blatant omission of an explicit discussion of the underlying causes of postpartum inequalities. They go on to say that black mothers and birthing people deserve care and to be cared for in the most optimal manner that fulfills their care needs and facilitates agency and self-efficacy during this service utilization. This is just one example of how recommendations from strong organizational entities may have unintended consequences when they do not explicitly address racial equity with a person-centered approach. The second example I'd like to discuss is around screening tools or algorithms, which can be embedded with bias. Universal screening of women for depression is one strategy in maternal health to improve outcomes. However, Sroka and colleagues argued that it has been deployed without really understanding if a depression screening tool can capture exposure to other discrimination stressors, which are known to impact black women. Their study found that the screening tool under identified women whose health was at risk and concluded that the tool really needs to be reconsidered to be more effective at improving black maternal health outcomes. Next is an extreme example, but it comes from obstetrical racism which is a concerning pattern of maltreatment of non-white pregnant women and includes a disregard for their birthing wishes. A study from the University of Colorado found that there has been a sharp rise in medically questionable inductions. The authors noted that obstetric care is being centered around the needs and preferences of white women. Finally, I'd like to zoom out and talk about implicit or unconscious bias and the patient-provider relationship. Here, implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. Now, there's a lot of research on this topic, but I'll conclude with saying that in healthcare, this unconscious bias might affect a provider's line of questioning, body language, or other subtle cues which may influence a patient's trust and their healthcare decision making. So knowing what we've covered thus far, it naturally begs the question, what can we do to address these issues? While I certainly can't provide a comprehensive list today, I'd like to touch upon an approach which many of you are familiar with that of patient-centered care. Patient-centered care encourages active collaboration and shared decision-making between patients, families, and providers to design and manage a customized care plan. As I mentioned with the racism, discrimination, and bias examples, there are ample opportunities within a care interaction for communication to shape the quality of care experience to produce either a positive or a negative health outcome. 
And I'll just note that in maternal health, the quality of this relationship is not fully understood. The literature on this topic is still growing. However, it has been demonstrated that Blacks and Hispanics receive less information from their doctors to aid in decision-making compared to their counterparts. Some studies have found that medical mistrust, which is a patient's belief that providers do not act in their best interest, might be mitigated with patient-centered communication skills, such as confirming if questions or concerns have been adequately addressed during an appointment. In maternal health, further research is required to better understand the kinds of provider behaviors that women perceive to be discriminatory. Similarly, this type of research is still growing in other parts of health. However, shared decision-making tools or tools which can help patients to feel empowered and able to self-advocate might be one part of a larger effort which can be integrated into intentionally strengthening the patient-provider relationship. One example of this tool could look like a postpartum care plan tool, which allows the patient to talk to their prenatal care provider about their long-term health concerns and goals. Thank you so much for having me join into your conversation today. If you have any questions, please reach out to me at shilpa at maternalspotlight.org. I'd love to have the opportunity to meet you and learn more about your interest in these topics.